in the image of God. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed and its fruit, you shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. Behold, it's very good. That's the only time creation is said to be very good, is after mankind is made. And there was an evening, and there was morning, a sixth day. That's Genesis 1, 26 through 31. That was in the Revised Standard Version. The Imago Day or the Christian doctrine of the divine image within humanity, may be one of the most overwhelming subjects I could attempt to make a short video reflecting on, let alone weaving creativity and counseling into it. I'm a bit nervous about this because I've not had the opportunity to reflect on scripture and Christian doctrine in the last two years as I have finished my master's in mental health counseling with the same vigor as I would if, as I would have during my MDiv. In fact, my reading of scripture has been quite limited, primarily in the evenings before bed or times with my children. It's been almost as reduced as my time spent painting. I'm out of practice in all areas. And so now, why would someone out of practice with painting tackle a reimagining of one of the most iconic and well-known artistic images? and hands of all things, which are notoriously difficult to create a believable image of. I guess it just felt right. The vulnerability of this painting is important to me. As you can see, I had to redraw the hands several times. I confess at times I was more than a little tempted to wipe away the footage of my failed attempts at drawing the way I wiped them from the canvas. What may have made this more embarrassing is that years ago, I did a different reimagining of the creation of Adam during a chapel service live with very little trouble. Lucky for me, my process of biblical study is not one which can be watched through a time lapse. And here you will only know my finished work and a very reduced chosen portion of my work at that. I hope that my Hebrew tutor, tutor does not come across this video to discover that I have remembered nearly nothing of the language I studied so diligently during my coursework, and that I won't be mentioning the language at all. The mistakes are important, though. They are what make me human. I think that the quick expansion of AI in our world, we have become afraid. The implications of our own humanity are increasingly important to us now, especially in the art community, where many feel that their work is becoming obsolete or at risk of becoming obsolete. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean that we're created in God's image? One of the things that really sticks out to me in this Genesis passage is our let us make man in our image. The presence of the Trinity seems almost implied from the very start here, despite the specifics of the doctrine not being finalized until the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. It is perhaps one of our most mysterious doctrines, 
and one that deserves much more time than I will give it in this video. What I will say is I find it interesting, as a mental health provider, that we are created in the image of God, and nearly every significant model of the human brain, mind, or psyche has been broken into three primary parts. DBT conceptualizes the mind as being split between emotional and rational, with wise mind or wisdom connecting the two as a third central part. Transaction transactional analysis divides the ego into three main states that interact, the parent, child, and adult. Freud's famous id, ego, and superego, of course, deserve mention. And much of modern neuroscience, while now conceptualizing the human brain as being much more interconnected and complex, has evolved from Dr. Paul McLean's work in the 1960s, where he defined the brain as literally triune. His breakdown of the brain and its parts remain extremely helpful in counseling settings, especially when explaining the impact of trauma, by the way. I could really go on about this for a whole video, but I won't. I'm simply fascinated by it. The Trinity is represented in this painting through the peonies, by the way, which are sometimes used to represent the Trinity in art. While the Imago Dei is immensely complex, my interest for this video is in the implications for the artist. In the ancient Near East, images were something that contained the essence of what they represented, allowing the image to carry out its function. This could be seen at times in ancient Egypt to describe the king as being made in the image of a deity. Through idol worship or in monuments. And here, in a piece of ancient Near Eastern literature, are scriptures. Here it describes the inception, the inception of humanity itself. Male and female, all as being bestowed upon the blessing to subdue the earth functioning as kings of creation. I find this passage an interesting contrast to um, others like Isaiah 40:18, for instance, or other uses of the word image to indicate idolatry, the worship of the created and not the creator. Psychology itself can certainly become an idolatrous thing, the thing we look to in a vain attempt to answer every question we have about ourselves. Thomas More in his work care of the soul aptly criticized the tendency to separate psychology from religion, moving toward what he calls a modernist syndrome. He says, a person may walk into therapy and say, look, I don't want any long-term analysis. If something is broken, let's fix it. Tell me what I have to do, I'll do it. Such a person, he says, is rejecting out of hand the possibility of the source of the problem in a relationship. This, too, is why I, unlike many I know, am not really afraid of therapy going the way of AI, at least not long term. Just as I don't fear art truly going away because of AI. Yeah, it may mean some changes. However, Thomas More was right. I feel that pressure not necessarily from clients actually but from insurance companies who scrutinize and weigh heavily on my mind as I work to sit with grieving and hurting people. I think the apps being produced to assist with direct interventions that can aid and improve mental health are more than welcome. People need help and they need it now. However, these apps are not embodied just as a painting on a screen cannot replace the feeling I got when I stood across from an original Degas at the Met a few years ago, it took my breath away. The humanity and the sensitiveness of it brought me to tears. There is something human about creativity that is not simply about the output. What I love about these verses in Genesis is that the scripture itself transitions to poetry in verse 27. It is specifically the first poetry in the Bible so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, created them male and female, he created them. In the image of God, in the triune and relational image, in the creative image. Augustine argues that in our search for the image of God, we should look to humanity. I'm sure when Michelangelo looked for a model for the Sistine Chapel, he referenced a human model. 
I can almost hear the keyboards clacking away now, reminding me, Allison, you're forgetting original sin and the depravity of mankind. No, I promise I'm not. Remember, this is a short video and I'm not making it to make an argument. My videos won't be reasoned and apologetically organized defenses from my points of view. I don't want to tell anyone what to think, but simply invite you to think. I've spent too many years now exploring the details and theories of theories and doctrines. I think too much of Christianity has become like the AI-generated mental health fixes, carefully generated answers and arguments devoid of relationship and humanity. Let us not forget, thousands of years ago, someone was divinely inspired to pen the words, let us make man in our image. And they, nor they, their children, or grandchildren, or great-grandchildren, or great-great-grandchildren would ever hear the word Trinity uttered, and yet they would preserve those words for us to reflect upon today. All this to say, I think humans should create more. Who cares if AI can do it faster or more precisely? I think another message of Genesis may just be that part of our charge as those created in God's image is to be creative ourselves. Recent studies have shown this, by the way. Specifically, working with our hands releases endorphins and serotonin in our brain. Gardening, painting, knitting, drawing, music, playing with our children, baking, I could go on. Thomas More says again, toward the end of Care of the Soul, We care for the soul by honoring its expressions, by giving it time and opportunity to reveal itself, and by living life in a way that fosters the depth, interiority, and quality in which it flourishes. Just yesterday, my 17-year-old approached me with such grace and encouraged me that she was happy to see me spending time painting again. It made her happy to see me creating again. After the wilderness of seminary, the wilderness of seminary is my term, not hers, she told me, you seem so much happier. And she's right. Maybe it's just the increase of serotonin, but I think it's more. Creative expression is a mindful process. It isn't just about the finished product. And not only do we need creative work as individuals, but creativity is needed on a societal level. Carl Rogers, in his famous work on becoming a person, argues that many of the serious criticisms of our culture and its trends may be formulated in terms of a dearth of creativity. He points to education as an example, turning out conformists, passive entertainment in contrast to active engagement, science focused on reliable technique and formula, industry focused on productivity, and households concerned maybe with looking like the homes of others, conformity. Sadly here, I would add, perhaps more guilty than all the other areas is that of the Christian church, which is often more conformist than the rest. All of this to say, I hope this video encourages you, mistakes and all. I really loved this painting. I loved creating this painting. I hope my vulnerability inspires you to be creative yourself. I hope to have embodied Carl's, Carl Rogers' encouragement about creativity. He said, If judgments based on external standards are not being made, then I can be more open to my experience, can recognize my own likings and dislikings, the nature of the materials, and my reaction to them. More sharply and more sensitively, I can begin to recognize my locus of evaluation within myself. Hence, I am moved toward creativity. I hope that you move toward creativity too. God bless you. See you next time.